Let us pray. Almighty God, we have called us to govern this province. We ask your help to make decisions and laws that will be just and will promote the interest of the people. Almachtige God, ons bid dat die gedurende ons vergaderings ons die nodige wijsheid sal gee en ons motiewe suiver sal hou en dat u ons sal help om ons tekortkominge te oorkom en al ons besluite aan u op te dra. Sieke Lela Elisbe Letu na Bantu Balu, u mesele u kulungu kui pondu Letu, in koosi Sieke Lela i Afrika, Gina Abantuana Bayo, Kokeli in Kokeli Zayo, Yenike i Kolo i Afrika. All this be back in your early name. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> order before I ask the secretary to read the order, let me give a ruling relating to Friday's debate. During the debate on Friday, 23 February, the Honourable Davids, in her speech, made certain references to the Jewish population group, directly or by innuendo, which could be interpreted as disparaging. She inter alia referred to some of them as, quote, Jewish, Jewish mafia, unquote. The Honourable Wiley and the Honourable Joseph, on points of order, objected to the remark on the grounds of it being insulting and anti-Semitic. At the time, I did not hear the specific reference but I did indicate that I, if indeed she had made such a remark, it would be unparliamentary. <coughs> I undertook to study Hansard and revert to the House. I have now had the opportunity to refer to the unrevised Hansard, and I have also checked the audio recording, and it is clear the Honourable Member had indeed made the remark. This is clearly in bad taste and not acceptable. Anti-Semitism is a form of racism, and such references will always be unacceptable in debate. In aggravation further, the remark was not made as an interjection in the heat of debate, but in a fully considered way in a prepared speech. I therefore rule that the remark is unparliamentary and order the Honourable Member Davids to withdraw the remark and to apologise. <coughs> Honourable Davids. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, I also read the insight. I didn't make a remark against the Jewish people. I made Honorable a remark Davids. against certain Jewish people. Honorable David, this is uh, a considered I ruling. If it's you withdraw and you apologize? Yes, Speaker. Oh. Thank you. The Secretary will read the order of the day. Reply to the debate on the Premier's State of the Province Address. I see the Premier. Thank you. Order, order. Premier, you may continue. <laughs> Honourable uh, Magaka, today is the time for the Premier to respond to the debate we had last week, so now is the time for, for, for reply. Premier, you have the floor. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'd like to begin by thanking the Honourable colleagues in the Governing Party very much for their considered and thoughtful contributions to the debate. In order of speaking, it was the Honourable Minister Madikizela, the Honourable Mitchell, the Honourable Minister Bridell, the Honourable Ngasela, the Honourable Minister Schaefer, the Honourable Beverly Schaefer, the Honourable Minister Mbombo, the Honourable Chief Whip Wiley, and the Honourable Minister Wundi. I want to thank this team for its quality and its integrity and the considered contributions to this House. Now, Deputy Speaker, may I come to the Honourable Opposition? I really do owe the Honourable the Opposition a great deal of thanks for making it as easy to reply to this debate as it is to shoot fish in a barrel. <laughs> the Honourable Magaka began by saying that he did not like my reply to his letter. His letter 
basically half instructing and half requesting me to, propose, to postpone SOPA. Now, I have absolutely no power to convene this parliament or to postpone or set the date of SOPA. That was the first point. The second point, Deputy Speaker, is that he completely fictitiously claims that it is a requirement to do so under the Constitution and under Intergovernmental Cooper Cooperation Framework Act. Now, that is entirely incorrect, and there is no such reference either in the Constitution or the Act. The fact is, the fact is that the ANC sucks constitutional injunctions out of its thumb when it wants to and entirely ignores those that actually exist. They come here with fake legal arguments. Now, the real violators of cooperative governance, Deputy Speaker, are the ANC. Because all of the legislatures and the national parliament agree last year on when the SONA is going to be held and when the various SOPAs are going to be held. And then entirely unilaterally to deal with an internal problem in the ANC, an internal problem in the ANC, they unilaterally postpone the State of the Nation address and then simply assume that the rest of the provinces will agree to postpone CNADA, which is without setting a date, indefinitely, until they are ready to deal with their softly, softly approach with their crook of a former president. Yes. And because they have an internal problem, every province has to be disadvantaged. Now, it is quite extraordinary to read this letter that was sent. The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition says to me that if we were to carry on with SOPA at the determined date, it would, it would amount to an illegitimate gathering. So unless the ANC says we can hold this meeting, even though it has been prearranged, he threatens me with a letter that says it will be an illegitimate gathering and that the sitting will not be properly constituted. The unbelievable thing is that this this rhetoric of illegal gatherings comes straight out of apartheid's lexicon, but it is used to apply to this House meeting on a pre-arranged date. Now when, in fact, the new president was sworn in, and when a date for SONA was set, we were happy to postpone the SOPA. <coughs> but we did it legitimately and legally, without threats and without illegitimate constitutional claims that don't actually exist in law. And I would like to ask the Honourable the Opposition, rather try and stick to the Constitution and the law when it matters, and not flout it at will, and don't invent claims in the Constitution that don't exist. Now, if I can just say that the ANC always puts itself ahead of the country and the spirit of Jacob Zuma lives on in this legislature. The spirit of Jacob Zuma lives on in this legislature. Almost every speech on that side. That's what I'm saying. The spirit of Jacob Zuma lives on in this legislature in the Honourable the Opposition. And I will show you, Deputy Speaker, 
how every single speech made by the Honourable Opposition violated the opening paragraphs of our Constitution. Every single speech made on the opposite side of the House violated the preamble of our Constitution, which says, we, the people of South Africa, recognise the injustices of our past, and we all do that. Honour those who suffered for justice and freedom in our land, and we all do that. You were not the only ones. What did you do, Honourable Magaka? Order. Respect. Order. Order. Respect. Respect those who have worked. Honourable Magaka, you've had your turn. Now it's the Premier to respond. We, the people, Speaker. respect those Please who speak. have worked. Premier, just one second. You've been interrupted by a member Please there. Speak. I'm sure you heard that, uh, that the Honourable Member said she's the Premier's a white reactionary. Order. Order. Order, uh, order, Premier, please continue. You see, the Honourable Magatka proves my point that the spirit of Jacob Zuma is alive and well in that honourable side of the House. The divide, the divide and rule on the basis of race. That is what Jacob Zuma devoted his presidency to. Divide and rule on the basis of race. In, in his State of the Nation speech last year, order, 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 Honourable Chifu. Uh, Sorry, but um, that's an unparliamentary remark, uh, Deputy Speaker. I did not hear what you said. Boss Wiley is absolutely unacceptable. I, who said that? Let's see if there's an ounce of integrity on that side. I will check. Order. Order. You say it. On Omagaka. I didn't say that. Please, please turn down your, your, your remarks about that. It could be against the parliamentary practice and rules. I'm I just don't put the spare that the Premier can continue her debate without a constant interruption. Yes, I'm, I'm at the point of also saying to members, I will, I will allow the Premier to continue, but I appeal to the ANC benches not to, not to go to a running commentary, but to make selective interjections if you want to make interjections. Premier. Thank you very much. Last year we heard President Zuma delivering the State of the Nation Address. And it was a litany of the things that were wrong with South Africa and then he concluded that it was all the fault of white people in South Africa. And this year, and this year, we heard a president who gave a totally different speech. What did President Ramaphosa say? He said, we should reaffirm our belief that South Africa belongs to all who live in it. Honourable Yankee, I've just asked you to turn down, please. President Ramaphosa said, we should reaffirm our belief that South Africa belongs to all who live in it. For though we are a diverse people, we are one nation. There are 57 million of us each with different histories, languages, cultures, experiences, views, and interests. Yet we are bound together by a common destiny. Deputy Speaker, we came here, we came here into this legislature and we heard a tone set by Jacob Zuma's sonar in 2017 and not by Cyril Ramaphosa's sonar of 2018. So we, out of respect, 
deferred our sopa till after the so na. And we also thought that that is what the ANC wanted. The Honorable the Opposition clearly didn't listen to a single word the Honorable Ramaphosa said in the National Parliament. They came here and they carried on beating the old racial nationalist divide and rule drum. And it was disgraceful. It is just an attempt to polarize people on the basis of race, which is all that the ANC has left, Mr. Deputy Speaker, because they haven't got a single policy, they haven't got a single idea, they haven't got a single track record that enables them to argue on the facts and the policies. Order. I would just, I would just like Order, to, to remind Magata. the Honourable Magatka that the National Party joined the ANC. That is what happened. And the National Party is sitting opposite us in the form of the Honourable Ace and the Honourable Bierwinkel and a couple of other people. Order. 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 Now you see, you see the Honourable Magatka, the Honourable Magatka makes two points which I would like to respond to, Honourable Deputy Speaker. The first response is that white people and other minorities who join the ANC can be classified as good. So the only good whites are those in the ANC. That is simply an outrageous, unconstitutional remark. The ANC is a racist party. There is nothing progressive or committed to non-racialism or constitutionalism about the ANC. It is fundamentally divisive and undermining of the Constitution. Then the Honorable Magatla, then the Honorable Magatla says I have been left in the past. The Honorable Magatla says I have been left in the past. Now let me tell you, there is one category of people in South Africa who have been left in the past, and that is those who still adhere to the ideology of Marxism. They have been left very far back in the past. Because of all the terrible legacies of colonialism, Mr. Deputy Speaker, Marxism is one of the worst. He sits here and he claims to be on the moral high ground of an ideology that has killed more people than any ideology in history. Than any other ideology in history. A hundred million people have died in the name of Marxism, which he still stands up and supports in this legislature today. So he must not talk about being stuck in the past, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And he represents the very worst of colonialism's legacy in the Marxists that still try to shape Africa according to their divisive legacy. But you know, order, order, Mr. Deputy Speaker, this shameful honorable leader of the opposition comes here and tries to divide people on the basis of race as a result of two terrible tragedies that happened in this province. There were two fires. One was the fire in Imizamoyetu, and the other was the fire in Neisner. And what does he do? He disgracefully comes here and says that we showed preference for the victims of the Neisner fire 
because of the race of the people who suffered and died in that fire as compared to the people who suffered and died in the Imizamoyetu fire. Mr. Deputy Speaker, there was only one group of people who showed no interest in the victims of the Imizamoyetu fire, and that was the national government of the ANC. They all came down in a long road to Naisna, but they didn't bother about Imizamoyetu. Now, Honourable Goka, is that a question or a point of order? Point I, of I, I think I want to ask you to rule. Is, is, is it parliamentary for the Premier to misrepresent the fact? Honourable <laughs> Goka. Um, because I know that the ministers were in Muzamwe too. Honourable Goka, that is. I was with the minister to in Muzamwe. Order, you've made your. You, I was order. in Muzamwe to carrying food. Honourable Goka. Honourable Goka, when the Mersi. chair speaks, you must remain quiet. The, the response from the chair is that that is not a point of order. You've made your political point already. Premier, please continue. He, out, he outrageously. The only people who ignored the community of Imizamo Yetu Sorry, was Premier. the national ANC the government. Chief Whip is on the floor. Chief Whip. Sorry, Premier. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition just said you committed a crime. She committed a crime. No. Uh, you, that's what you said. You, no, that's what you said. She committed a crime. Order. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, that indicating a person directly and telling him they committed a crime is unacceptable. It is. If, if the reference was to a member of the House, certainly that would be unparliamentary. Did the member refer to another member of the House? Uh, he, was referring directly. he said he did not, so I take the member's word for the moment. Pre Premier, you may continue. Order. Order. Compared to the crimes committed by communism and its legacy, we can live with that. Um, the honourable member tries to misrepresent the facts in this house by saying that we committed 75 million rand to the victims of the Nisner fire. That is not true, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The 75 million rand was for the victims of all the fires in this province. But let me go through, let me go through the actual numbers of what was committed to Imi Zamoyetu. I hope you listen. Because an unbelievably large and coordinated effort went in to helping the community of Imi Zamoyetu reconstruct and recover. That informal settlement had no layout, no formal structure, and no access for emergency vehicles. So one of the first things that was done in the process of reconstruction was super blocking. And the budget for the super blocking is 126 million rand. And that involves additional roads, pedestrian pathways, formal electrification, water and sanitation. Order. So to say that the DA ignored Imizamo Yetu is a complete disgrace. Secondly, the city established three temporary relocation areas and rehoused people. Most of the people in the Nisner Fire Deputy Speaker were not rehoused. They had to make provisions for themselves. Order, order, they were not rehoused. Honourable Birvankel, please contain yourself there. Thank you. <laughs> Premier, please continue. So while DA spheres of government made provision for all of the victims to be rehoused in Imizamoyetu, the victims of the Nisner fire had to make provisions themselves to get rehoused. Now, I was very interested to see the breakdown of one department alone, 
And it was 33 million rand in the aftermath of the Imizama Yetu fire. And let me look at the full budget, which is 106 million rand. I can go down into the breakthrough, but it is here on this piece of paper, the budget. And then what about private donations? Here are 11 pages, Mr. Deputy Speaker, 11 pages of enumerated private donations in small print to the victims of the Imizamu Yetu fire. It, every single cent of it went to the victims of the Imizamu Yetu fire in one way or the other. And a huge amount of the donations that were sent to Neisner were also re-diverted to Imizamu Yetu. Food, water, a range of things. And for three months, people in Imizamu Yetu were fed every day, and that was not the case in Neisner. So when you enumerate point by point, rand for rand, support measure by support measure, you will see that the people of Imizamu Yetu got every bit as much support, if not more, than the people of Neisner. So it is a complete and utter disgrace to come here and try and make political capital out Order. of it. Order. <laughs> Premier, just one second. Just one second, Premier. Order. Honorable McElhinney. Thank you, Speaker. Can, Speaker, can I ask the Premier a question on the IOI issue? Premier, are you prepared to take a question? Yes, I am. Premier is prepared. Premier, if I can invite you to a meeting in IOI to explain this, can you do that? Yeah. Premier? I will ha happily go to a meeting anywhere anywhere in the, in the Western Cape to explain anything to people. Yes, of course. Of course. It is completely disgraceful. It is completely disgraceful, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that people come here with divisive, unconstitutional, manipulative attempts to polarize people on the basis of race for their own political purposes. That belongs to the Jacob Zuma ANC. And that is what we have to leave behind in this house. The DA is far in advance of the ANC because we passionately live the non-racialism that is the core principle of the Constitution. The Honorable Magata and his colleagues live in the past of racial divide and rule strategies, and they live that every single day. Order. Order. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it's amazing how any issue, even whether it's a disagreement about an issue of principle, gets turned into a race issue by the Honorable Opposition. They have no other issue. It is pitiful and it is unconstitutional. Mr. Deputy Speaker, unsurprisingly, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition also used water to divide people on the basis of race. He comes along and gives a completely fictitious calculation here, saying that the National Department of Water and Sanitation has said that the cost of a desalinator that could produce 180 million liters of water per day was 1.3 billion. Now I understand very clearly why that National Department got the worst audit outcome in government, Mr. Deputy Speaker. That department, as well as the Honorable Magatla, obviously belongs to the Jacob Zuma School of Mathematics. Let's just try and do a little bit of a calculation here. The cost of service water, Deputy Speaker, is 5 rand 20 per kiloliter to clean and deliver. 
The cost of desalinated water is 18 rand, give or take, per kiloliter. It certainly is true on a short-term contract, which is what they were talking about. Now let's look at 180 megalitres a day. Look at 180 megalitres per day. Now, one megalitre is 1,000 kilolitres. So we start with 180,000 kilolitres, multiplied by 18, multiplied by 365 days, multiplied by three years. It does not give you 15 billion, but it certainly does not give you 1.3 billion. Order. We were talking about 500 million litres of water today. We were talking about the cost of generating 500 million litres of water a day, which is what the city promised to produce. And that is the calculation we were working on. If that is the way the Department of Water and Sanitation calculates its tenders. No wonder that the Guiani water scheme ballooned from 500 million to 5 billion. They obviously did the same kind of calculation as the Honorable Magata came to give here. And no wonder there is an unbelievable crisis now with the Lesotho Highlands water scheme which will make Gauteng water insecure till 2025. There have been massive overruns on that project too. And not only that, just as there was with the Clan William Dam, the project was stalled so that it could go out to another tender so that Zupta-aligned cronies could get those tenders, pushing up, pushing up the cost massively and making that department have the worst, have the worst. Order. I'm Order. coming to the Honorable Davids. She'll have enough to chirp about when I come to her. Believe me, she will have enough to chirp about when I come to her, Order. Mr. Deputy Speaker. Order. Honorable Davids, Honorable Mugaka. Order. If the Honourable Magaka and Honourable Davids wants to hear the end of the speech, they must please behave themselves now. Please continue, Premier. Is it parliamentary for the Honourable the Leader Opposition to say, continue with your rubbish? Order. Order. Uh, Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. It's irrelevant whether the Premier says it all the time because if she says she has to withdraw it, just the way they're going to withdraw that now. Order. Um, we've ruled before on the, on the use of the word rubbish. In that sense, it's not unparliamentary. When you refer to an individual of the House as being rubbish, it's unparliamentary. Please continue, Premier. So you said I was continuing with my rubbish, so he was referring to me. If, order. If the reference was directly leveled at a member of the House, that would be unparliamentary. It was, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. He said, well, why don't you continue with your rubbish? Premier, that would be in order. If, the, if, he, had said the, if he had said the Speaker or the Premier is rubbish, that's slightly different. I accept your ruling, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It gives me more leeway, too. Honourable Gaga. There is only one statistic that you get from the National Department of Water and Sanitation that can be taken seriously, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and that is zero. They have zero credibility. Zero credibility at all. The Honorable Davids took the water issue forward in pursuing the ANC's divide and rule strategy in the most anti-Semitic speech I have heard in this House. Order. Another violation of the Constitution. And as you said, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in a formally written speech, both the Honorable Magatla and the Honorable David's speech were formally written and prepared. 
so they were considered divide and rule attempts in violation of the Constitution and in violation of the tone set by President Ramaphosa in the SONA. But this is what the Honourable David said. The DA fabricated the day zero water crisis in Cape Town to set the scene for desalination kickbacks for the Jewish mafia. Order, Honourable Gauka. Order. I've just ruled on that. Please withdraw that. Please stand up and withdraw that. Please withdraw. Can, can, I can't hear you. I've ruled earlier on when uh, Honourable David used the same expression that is unparliamentary. The kickback. No, the, the reference, the reference to, the, to the Jews. No, 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 no. I was referring to the amount of the Honourable kickback. Honourable Gauka. You, you used the exact same word, so okay. please no, withdraw. I will, I will draw that Thank one. you. But I don't withdraw the 660 million. <laughs> That's something different. Premier, you may continue. Be Honourable Premier, before you go, Honourable Olipir, do you want to ask a question? No, Speaker, can I just, can I just address you? On what? Deputy Speaker, given, given the fact that uh, there was a ruling on, on the matter that the Premier now is raising, and uh, Honourable Davis has withdrawn. Is, can the, speak, the, the Premier continue to respond to those issues? I'm just asking for my own clarity. If it's now withdrawn after your ruling. Yeah, it's a very short, very short answer the Premier may, yes. Premier, you may continue. I think the matter of these tenders needs to be cleared up. Because a former member of this House A former member of this House, the Honourable Lentet, the formerly Honourable Lentet, has made claims that have absolutely no basis in fact, none at all. First of all, in the DA, politicians don't influence tenders in any way. Number one. Number two, if anybody wants to put in a tender, whether they're from Saudi Arabia or Israel or Iran or Yemen or anywhere else, China, they are free to do so. And they will be adjudicated against the criteria of the tender and nothing else. They won't be adjudicated on the basis of their race or religion or anything else unless it complies with the law of this country. And that is how we adjudicate tenders. At this point, Mr. Deputy Speaker, three tenders have been awarded. People bid for those tenders. And I can tell you that the allegations that Mr. Lentet makes have absolutely no basis in fact whatsoever. You are welcome to test them wherever you like. The mayor has no power about the awarding of tenders. And if the mayor tries to award a tender or to stop a tender, it is unlawful and it is illegal. You cannot try to stop a tender or grant a tender as the mayor or the premier. And people must understand that. Negations to Israel to find out about their water saving and their water desalination projects. I've got a photograph of a whole ANC delegation in Israel finding out about water. So if the honorable Doug Moore claims that we are a group of hypocrites, as he did in a moment ago. There's no greater hypocrisy than the Honorable ANC, who accuses us of doing one thing totally without basis, in fact, but they do that thing all of the time and repeatedly. And let me please say again, Deputy Speaker, let me please say Order. again, Deputy Speaker, I will say that to lend it anywhere. You see, the irony about Lentet's statement, the great irony, Mr. Deputy Speaker, about Lentet's statement, 
Was it revealed that there were alleged attempts to manipulate tenders? And that is the problem. Read his statement. How did he get the money to build a house in Platteclub? Order. 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 The Premier said, Order. Arnold Scott, uh, touch him. I almost called your names again. Please come to order. The Premier may continue. And then, then the Honourable Davids, referring to the Tafelberg School, can't resist. And then the Honourable Davids can't resist another dig, saying the sale of land in Seapoint in the Jewish area, as if we have group areas. She didn't apologize for that. She apologized for the Jewish mafia, but she did not apologize for all about this land in the Jewish area, as if we have ghettos, as if we have group areas in South Africa anymore. Order. Order, Honorable David, you've had your turn. The legacy of colonialism persists in the ANC with their commitment to Marxism and racism. Now, Honorable, Honorable Deputy Speaker, this government believes in freedom of religion. And we believe that Muslims or Jews or Christians or Hindus You see, Mr. Deputy Speaker, how sorry she is about the racism that she propounded here in this house. She's doing it again. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we believe in the freedom of religion and we take it seriously. And if people want to raise their children and educate their children within their religious paradigm, we believe they should be free to do so if they're prepared to pay for it. And that is why we defend that, because it's called defending the Constitution. If people are allowed to have their... I'll explain to the Honorable Ace. Freedom and paying for things, freedom does not always mean free. You know, truly, the Honourable Ace is not the sharpest tool in the shed, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I will explain to you. If you are in a public school, you cannot only have one religion for catered in the public school. If you have an independent school and are prepared to pay for it, you can. Does the Honourable Member understand that now? In an open... In an open public school, you cannot discriminate against anybody for their religion. You cannot anywhere, actually. But if you want a school to have a specific religious approach, you What the Honorable Ace is saying is that you should be able to discriminate in public schools. I am saying no one can discriminate anywhere. I am not saying that. Order. I am saying that if Muslims would like to have a school that teaches within the parameters of Islam, they can do it. If Jews want to do it, they can do it. If Hindus want to do it, they can do it. But in public schools, all children of whatever religion should have access. That is what I am saying. And it should be clear to everyone. How hard is it for anybody to understand that? 
There are a lot of people who believe that only one religion should be allowed in some public schools, and I disagree with that. No. Let's go back to the notion that the Honorable David's floated here, that the DA fabricated the water crisis. Maybe the Honorable David's would like to tell the House why a charge of fraud has been laid against her and what was fabricated to get to that point. What was fabricated to get to that point? Perhaps the Honorable David's would... A criminal and she's doing wrong things all the time. So it's an attack on her character as member of this House. Um, I saw the Honourable Chief Whip first. The Premier simply posed questions. Simply posed questions based, based on the comments that were made by the Honourable Member. But in any case, the Honourable Member uh, David's on the other side has called the Premier a liar. Order. And that needs a withdrawal. Order. Honourable uh, Mayor, I want to close this, this chapter, but if you want to address me quickly. You've done. Yes, Premier, we, we uh, have a practice and rule that we can't cast dispersions of, on, on people in the House unless by way of substantive motion. But if you, in a cursory way, refer to, to certain issues... May I, ask a, may I uh, address you on this point, you Mr Deputy Speaker? The Honourable Member Davids accused us of fabricating the DA of fabricating day zero. That was allowed. Now I'm asking about the fabrications and I'm asking the question. The David, Honourable Davis can get up and say, I never fabricated my tra travel claims. But she can do that with pleasure. Premier, besides, I'm just listening to Premier. Premier, are you done with that argument? The Honourable A stood up. I'm not done at all. The Honourable David accused us of committing fraud against the public of the Western Cape by fabricating day zero. So I'm asking a couple of questions about where the real fabrications lie. Yes, Honourable A. But you gave an opportunity for the Premier to explain, but then she started to carry on with the speech. I think she must first apologise. For what? And, and of course, the Deputy Speaker made a ruling. Order, order. The, the order, the, the request was not to apologise. The, the Deputy Speaker, the, the Chair simply indicated that... Order. The Chair simply indicated that when you want to accuse a member of the House of certain things like this, then it must be by way of substantive motion. Yes, now I'm asking a question. I'm allowed to pose questions in this House. Uh, Premier, un Deputy unfortunately, even asking a question could be regarded as casting that same inspiration exactly. if, you, if you relate. That is in terms of our practice. Yes. Well, may I ask you then, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, what, what it is to accuse this government of fabricating day zero? Is that casting aspersions? The, the, the main, Premier, the main difference is that the one you refer to now is casting aspersions on a group of people or the party, the not on an individual member. That is, that is the difference. Well, that's fine then. Order, order. All right, I'll take care not to do it against an individual. Perhaps the Honourable the ANC yeah. would like to tell us for how long travel claims were fabricated. Order. Yeah. Honourable Helen Zill must not take us for granted. No, speak for a ride on us. She is a member of this legislature, just like any other person. She doesn't have a, a right to just continue as order, to order, order, as members. To withdraw, just as we do when we made a mistake. Order. The Premier now changed, changed the accusation to the party in general, the way I read it, which, which does not refer to a specific member in the House. One more, one more one. Premier's response is perfectly acceptable. At, at your suggestion, she, re, she rephrased the question into, into a parlance which is perfectly acceptable for the House. 
Premier, you may continue uh, as long as you keep it to the party and not to a specific individual. No, Thank uh, you very much. All right. Deputy Speaker, when there's a reference to travel claims, there's reference to members in this House. Yes. yes. Otherwise, this, and then when there's reference to members in this House, that's not allowed. And it's very clear. Can she then refer to all 40 members? It's unacceptable. Order. Order. I'm not going to allow a full, a full debate on this specific topic, Honourable Schaefer. Speaker, and the same applies to the fact that Member Yankee is creaming out allegations around myself. If you have something to say, you need to have a consistency here, Order. Speaker. So can we ask these speakers to stop screaming out all kinds Order. of allegations? Order. Around me? Let me, let me, Order. Let me say finally that it's when you want to accuse a specific member of the House of, of wrongdoing, it must be by way of substantive motion. A cursory, a cursory uh, casual reference in a, in a debate is fine, but you can't embroider on that and make a substantive speech about something which is that serious. So, Premier, you may continue. Um, dating back to the time of the Travelgate scandal in the National Parliament to the present day in this legislature, would the Honourable the ANC like to tell us for how long travel claims have been fabricated on the subject of fabrication. Perhaps the Honourable the ANC would like to tell us how much money was involved in these fabrications. On second thoughts, perhaps the Honourable Dugmore is in the best position too. Because the Honourable Dugmore acted in defence of the Honourable Davids. Mm. Now we all know Deputy Speaker, that the Honourable Dugmore is also a graduate of the Jacob Zuma School of Political Ethics. He is a graduate of the Jacob Zuma School of Political Ethics. In, in his own CV on the net, the Honourable Dugmore boasts that he was a special advisor in Jacob Zuma's presidency, December 2009 to May 2014. Imagine anyone having that on their CV. Honourable Deputy Speaker. Honourable Ace. Honourable Deputy Speaker, I think the Premier, Sharon, please, man. Order, order. I think there's a misquote from there. He was a special advisor in Trevor Manuel's office. That's the point. Not for Jacob Zuma. Order, order. Tell the truth. Order, Premier, you may continue. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm reading from Cameron Dugmore's own CV, the Honorable Dugmore's own CV. He doesn't mention Trevor Manuel in this heading. Previous positions, special advisor, Presidency of South Africa. Shame. Maybe he's going to deny it. Order. He boasts, he boasts, he boasts in his CV that he spent five years in the Jacob Zuma presidency as a special advisor. And he's clearly proud of it. Now we know, we know, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Order, order, order. We know what happened in the Zuma presidency between 2009 and 2014. State capture came to full bloom. It was strategized. It was devised in the presidency. And the Honorable Dugmore never once spoke out against it. Never once. We need to know, Mr. Deputy Speaker, how the Honorable Dugmore has applied these state capture tricks in this legislature. And we need to interrogate his interactions with the prosecution in our internal Sharon, Honourable Sharon Davids's disciplinary hearing. The questions I ask here, Mr. Deputy Speaker, was the prosecution captured? Was he our own Sean Abrams? 
Number two, why were witnesses not called in that disciplinary hearing? Number two, why was the charge softened? Number three, we need to know, Deputy Speaker. Speaker, order, order, Chief Whip. Honorable Deputy Speaker, that uh, disciplinary um, session uh, of the conduct committee was held uh, confidentially. And for the uh, Premier to quote here now is totally wrong. And somebody gave you information that's also wrong. And I would like to, you to, uh, to, uh, to caution the Premier, please. Order. Um, yes, the, the hearing might have been in, 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 in closed hearing, but the report to the House became public knowledge. There were two reports on that committee to the House. Premier, may I continue? Order, Premier, there's another one, Honourable Chacham. The detailed information did not go through the ATC. So what the Premier is quoting here is something that some of us were not there. You won't know. So you need to distinguish between what went to the ATC. Yes, and I, what I, I hear your point. I cannot Premier comment on the fact whether the, what the Premier is now saying exactly is in the... Yes, you may then. Deputy Speaker, I would like you to, to please make a ruling on some matters of fact that have been presented here. The first one being that I was a special advisor to the Minister in the Presidency for National Planning. That's number order. one. Secondly, order, order, secondly that's I would like you to check the record and clarify that. And secondly, everyone in this House knows that I represented Honourable Member Davids as the rules order, allow Honourable, Honourable to represent All those, those points are very valid debating points, but they are not points of order. They're absolutely not points of order, and it's absolutely valid for me to raise it in this context. Because Jacob Zuma was, let's be frank, a crook of a president. You just have to read the president's keepers. And in fact, one of his keepers was the Honourable Dugmore as a consultant in the presidency. And he never once spoke up or said a word about state capture or anything else. And it doesn't matter whether he was a consultant to this one or that one or served to promote Jacob Zuma. We have a commission on state capture, Mr. Deputy Speaker, which Order. if you read... Order. Order. I, will, I have been 100% open about the D. There is absolutely nothing irregular about a political party asking a company for a donation. As long as there are no favours in return, as long as there are no strings that can be pulled afterwards, and there aren't. At the time that everybody was fundraising from the Guptas, Order. their nefarious activities were not known. We approached Sahara computers and not the Guptas. Now, whoever... Order. Order. There was come to nothing order. wrong with getting a donation as long as there were no strings attached. Honourable Magaka, you've made Honourable Magaka, you've made your point now. The Premier is responding. You know, you know, Deputy Speaker, these interjections. Order. Deputy Speaker, these interjections show show why our country is in the state it's in under the ANC. Honourable Gaka, you are now deliberately Speaker. trying to interfere with the Premier's response. And if you can Deputy if Speaker. carry on that way, I'm going to ask you to leave the chamber. Please continue, Premier. Deputy Speaker, for a party that was systematically captured by the Guptas, that allowed the Guptas, for example, to get a five billion rand kickback on a tender for locomotives that was 50 billion rand and that did not even fit the tracks is what I mean by capture. The Guptas bankrolled Jacob Zuma and a couple of other people and in return for that favor got billions upon billions upon billions of rands of contracts and kickbacks from the government. That is capture. We got 250,000 rand as a donation, no strings attached, no favours, no kickbacks. The two things cannot be compared, Mr Deputy Speaker.
the big problem, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is that the ANC from top to bottom does not understand constitutionalism and the rule of law. They have no idea what it means. No. Order. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to make a contention that there was a travesty right here in this legislature. Order. And that there are some questions that need to be answered, probably masterminded by people trained in the Jacob Zuma School of Political Ethics. Was the prosecution in this case captured? Why were the key witnesses not called? Why was the charge softened? We need to know this, Speaker. What happened? Order, please. What happened in this legislature would not pass the constitutional test of rationality or legality and should actually be reviewed in a court of law. In the meantime, we are waiting to see what progress is made with the police investigation of the fraud case. And believe me, if that case has been withdrawn, as the Honorable Davids has interjected, I will make sure that there is justice in this matter, because we cannot cover up injustice and abuse of process in this legislature just because we happen to be in government here. This Honorable Member Davids has the nerve to come here and talk about a Poloni Gatsby, as she did before, and a birthday cake when she won't answer questions about travel claims, the amount of money involved, and what she's been doing for months in this legislature. Now let me get to the Honorable Doug Moore. The Honorable Doug Moore is quite right. Crime and violence has worsened. Guns and drugs have worsened. I certainly did read that book, Madam Speaker. Order, please. And the book explains to us why. The Principal's Agent Network. Order, please. And Arthur Fraser and the network around the gangs, and the siphoning of guns from the police, and the protection of the drug racket, and the involvement of President Jacob Zuma, while this honorable member, Doug Moore, was an advisor to the president, this honorable member, that same president, was meeting the worst gangsters at his official residence. And the gangsters said to each other, don't worry about the president, he's one of us. And then you wonder, Madam Speaker, why violence and drugs and gangs and guns are getting worse. In fact, I can add a few more things for the Honorable Doug Moore that were getting worse. Everything the national government is responsible for in this province, from bulk water to rail transport to gangs and drugs, is getting worse. Because they had the gangster in chief in the presidency being advised by the Honorable Doug Moore. Order, please. Honorable Yankee. Thank you. Your now, interjections are becoming a running commentary. Thank you. The Honorable. I'm here. The Honourable Dugmore. The Honourable Dugmore comes here and says the reason that crime and drugs and gangs and guns was getting worse was because the Bambanani school guards were taken away. Now we've got professional crooks in government, Madam Speaker, but he wants amateur school guards to deal with the professional crooks in government that are funding the gangs. But let's go back to 2007, while the ANC, Madam Speaker, was in government. And now you see the calls 
This is an article dated, dated 7th of June 2007. Oh, Calls from members of the ANC to disband the Bambananis. Here it is. 2007. Calls from the ANC to disband the Bambananis. So even his pathetic aim here to come and say that we've got more crime in the Western Cape because there aren't Bambananis here falls apart on even the most minor Google search, which will tell you that the ANC was working hard to scrap the Bambananis as far back as 2007 with the ANC support. Now, what we have is the Bambananis versus the PA in the parallel system of crooks in the intelligence Order, and security please. system. Honourable Dianke, maintain yourself. Yeah, but then you have the option of leaving if you don't want to listen to it. But whilst you're here, you remain quiet and you manage yourself. Thank you. You may proceed, Premier. Then the Honourable Doug Moore comes here and misleads this house again by saying our matric pass rate has dropped. He doesn't even listen. He d okay, he's just repeated here, Madam Speaker, that we are second to other provinces. On what criteria? He doesn't even listen to his own minister, Minister Angie Mochecha, who says that the real pass rate is the one on the comprehensive basket of criteria which includes the retention rates, which includes the quality of passes, which includes maths and science participation. And on the comprehensive basket of criteria, the Western Cape is way out on top. It is very easy, Madam Speaker. We are number one. We absolutely are number one. Because, Madam Speaker, because, Madam Speaker, we are not prepared to push a quarter of our students, half our students, out of the system so that those who write matric can pass between 30 and 40 percent. We don't consider that a success. We consider it a success to keep as many kids as we can in school and to support them to do as well as they can and to get exemptions to go to university. And it is quite amazing that in our quintile one schools that the Honourable Magaka wasn't obviously listening to when I spoke, they have almost a quarter of matric exemptions to go to university, higher than any other please sector. Below 80%. Order, please. Order. Honourable Dagmo, if you wish to pose a question, please do it through the chair. Order, members. Minister Schaefer, Member Dagmo, outside of the House, please. You may proceed, Premier. So we take all of those criteria into account. How many kids stay at school? How many get exemptions? How many participate in maths and science? And those are critical statistics to take into account. And on that comprehensive basket, the Western Cape is way out in front. But that, of course, the Honorable Dugmore prefers to ignore because he belongs to the Jacob Zuma School of Mathematical Calculation. Housing delivery has also increased exponentially. Order. You see, Madam Speaker, even though the ANC governs eight provinces, the Honorable Dugmore couldn't come here and name one single province that is an example of good governance to follow. Not one. And, and he could not even give me an example from the time that the ANC was in government here. He couldn't give me a single example from the time when the ANC was in government here. Take the Children's Commissioner. Order, please, Honourable Janke. Take, take the Children's Commissioner. We are well advanced in this process. We have written a bill now. We have compiled a bill. We have been out on public comment on the bill. And we're currently doing an in-depth review of the comments received on the bill. And here is the timetable for the rest of this year on the Children's Commissioner. So the Honourable Dugmore is welcome to go to the Constitutional Court. I can tell you the Honourable Judges there will throw it out because we're well into the process of doing it. And the Honourable Judges will also ask the Honourable Dugmore 
what the ANC did when they were in government. They didn't lift a finger, and we are nearly all the way through the process, Honourable Speaker. That is what Order. hypocrisy is all about. That is what hypocrisy is all about. Honourable Doug, more questions through the chair, please. Now we look at employment equity. The Honourable Dugmore outrageously says that we are flouting employment equity status in the whole of government. Designated groups who are all weighed appropriately in the employment equity legislation. Designated groups in the whole of government, 94.9%. Senior management service only, designated groups, 80.3%. You can interrogate it. Here's the statistic. He just sucks ideas out of his thumb. He's from the Jacob Zuma School of Integrity as well. Promotions. Promotions by salary band. The promotions in the latest statistics I've got is 1617, 2016 to 2017. Promotion in designated groups, 85.7%. And Sutu and Swana and Malay. And what kind of absolute divine and rule nonsense is that? And SMS promotions, SMS promotions. 83.3%. So, this, this order, please, Honourable McCarthy. This Honourable Opposition. Through the chair. This Honourable Opposition, Madam Speaker, are only interested in race. And they use race as a cover for cater deployment to drive corruption. That's what it is. Yes. Honourable Makaka, that's unparliamentary. She must open her ears. You are referring directly to the Premier. Were you referring to the Premier? No, I'm not referring to the Premier. So who is she then, Honourable Makaka? Uh, okay. uh, the DA is now a she. Okay. You may proceed, Premier. You see, in his, in his recent, recent budget speech, when the Honorable Gigaba had to break his head about state-owned enterprises, he said there were three things they could do with state-owned enterprises. Firstly, they could privatize them. Secondly, they could give more state money to them, which they can't afford to do. And thirdly, they could sell off non-core assets such as land to fund them. And that honorable side of the House was dead quiet, Madam Speaker. They have said nothing about it because they know that all the large pieces of land, Kulumborg, Easterplatt, Youngfield, Wingfield, are all the places that we can really start transforming the legacy of apartheid spatial planning. But they will not release that land for anything. But what do they do? They point to a small piece of land in Seapoint, which is not viable for cross-subsidization in the housing model, is not viable, and that actually reveals their real agenda, which was revealed so clearly here in the Honorable David's speech. That was their motive. So, from beginning to end, from beginning to end, Madam Speaker. Honorable Chacham, that's number three interjection. Number four, you go. Thank you. He is consistent in interjecting, yes, and disrupting. So, not satisfied with the divide and rule strategies between black and white Minister and colored and, and, and African, and not satisfied between trying to target minorities such as Jews. The ANC comes here and through the Honorable Dugmore starts with traditional leaders in the Khoisan and completely disingenuously claims 
that we on this side of the house have not created a house of traditional leaders. Now that is just bizarre or dishonest. Because a national commission on the recognition of traditional leaders from the national government considered all the applications for recognition from the Western Cape and found that none qualified for recognition as traditional leaders. This was the ANC's own government. So how does the Honorable Doug Moore justify calls to create a house of traditional leaders in the Western Cape when his government has recognized nobody? What would that house do? The bottom line through you, Madam Speaker, is that determining whether there are traditional leaders rests in the national government. And they have determined there are none. So what does it leave me to propose, Madam Speaker? Then he goes on, then the Honorable Dugmore goes on to the Khoisan in general. Now the responsibility lies with the ANC government again to draft legislation for the recognition of Khoisan traditional leaders. The current bill is doing the rounds and was drafted in 2015. The fact that draft legislation has in fact been doing the rounds since 2011 and that the national government has not yet finalized it speaks volumes. So that is where the problem with the Khoi and the San lies, not with the Western Cape. But he trivializes the National Commission and he trivializes the seven years that legislation has been running around doing nothing and then claims that this government rejects the Khoi and the San simply because I could not attend one function of the castle. This is completely this is completely hypocritical and dishonest. And in fact, the Honorable Murray does a lot on a regular basis to ensure the recognition of the Khoi and the San and every other culture to the extent that provincial governments have the power to do so. So on every single issue, Madam Speaker, on whites, blacks, and coloreds, on Jews and Muslims, on the Khoi and the San, on minorities and majorities, this debate on behalf of the ANC was nothing but a divide and rule extension of Jacob Zuma's ill-starred and disastrous term as president of South Africa. We have never bought into that paradigm. But we suggest to the Honorable the Opposition that it's time to make a shift and to remember what President Ramaphosa said. We should reaffirm our belief that South Africa belongs to all who live in it. For though we are a diverse people, we are one nation. There are 57 million of us, each with different histories, some of which of us were refugees, absolutely. Some of us were refugees like me. Each of us with different histories, languages, cultures, experiences, views, and interests. Yet we are bound together by a common destiny. And again, the Honorable Davids doesn't understand that. She says, I may be a refugee, but she is not. So by virtue of that statement, she's excluding anyone whose forebears may have been refugees from being South African. Yeah. This is exactly the divide and rule strategy I'm talking about. And it's time to get beyond it and stand up for our constitution. Thank you, Speaker. Don't, he, uh, just leave us, he's crazy. Oh, okay. <laughs> Premier, have you concluded that? Thank you, Honourable Premier. That concludes the debate on the Premier's State of the Province Address. That concludes the business for the day. The House is adjourned. I thank you.